Hi, this is Ben Lowell, and welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. We're continuing our Christmas series today with Dr. John Newfeld with a message entitled, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Let's turn in our Bibles to Jeremiah, chapters 30 and 31, as we join Dr. Newfeld now. Christmas is the story of God becoming a man, and even while God became fully man, yet he did not cease to be God. I mean, that's the mystery of what we call the incarnation. God came to us in the clothing of humanity, but by saying this, I don't mean clothed simply as a cover for what's underneath, but fully human. That is, Jesus, who is fully God, the second person of the Trinity, experienced our humanity fully, with, of course, the exception of our sin. He came as a baby. He grew in the way that we all grow. He learned just like us. He experienced life as we do. He struggled with temptation just as we do. He knew joy and sorrow. He laughed. He cried. And says the writer of Hebrews, he even learned obedience by what he suffered much in the way that we do. But of course, Jesus did not come because God was curious about human experience. He came because human beings are a ruined race that needed to be saved. And one of the places where that's seen best is in the story of the aftermath of the visit of the wise men. Herod, the king of the Jews, an intelligent man, a man who's still known to this day for his enduring building projects, which included the temple at Jerusalem and the very famous city of Caesarea, also the famous fortress at Masada. I mean, this Herod was also a vicious and jealous and suspicious and cruel man. When the wise men came from Jerusalem, saying they were seeking the one who was born king of the Jews, Herod was immediately interested. He told the wise men to go and find this one and then report back where the child was so that he might also go back and worship him. But God warned the wise men in a dream not to go back to Herod, for Herod had the murder of the child in view. So here's how Matthew reports it. I'm reading Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 to 18. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more." You know, it's hard to read this text without reflecting on horrible acts of terrorism that we see in our day. This is the killing of the innocents. It's simply another act of savage cruelty in a world prompted by a love of power. Now, of course, there are many wonderful stories around Christmas, but the background of the wonder of Christmas is a very black curtain. And as Matthew faithfully recounts the story of Christmas, his mind is taken up in an ancient prophecy found in Jeremiah 31, verse 15. And so today, since I've entitled this series, Christmas from the Beginning of Time, tracing the story of Christmas through the Old Testament account, I think it fitting to go to Jeremiah chapters 30 and 31, the very place that Matthew quotes when discussing the account of the rage of Herod. I know that many of us know very little about Jeremiah and why he figures into the Christmas story, so let me give you a little background. Jeremiah's ministry as a prophet in Israel extended from the years 627 to 580 BC, so he's a prophet and a preacher for about 47 years. That's a long time. And they were tumultuous years. During his lifetime, Babylon had become a world empire. See, in the Bible, Babylon is a symbol for everything that's evil and satanic. See, in the beginning of the Bible, it was called Babel, where men built a tower. And in the end of the Bible, it's the kingdom of the Antichrist, where a new tower of evil is going to be built. But in Jeremiah's time, it's more than just a symbol. It's it's the reality in which he lived. It had become the world's superpower, and it would destroy Jerusalem. In 605 BC, they sent their troops against Jerusalem, and they captured the first of the Jews. You know this from the book of Daniel, as the young man Daniel and other members of the Jewish elite were taken into captivity. And then eight years later, in 597 BC, the king of Babylon came back, this time capturing the king of Israel himself, along with members of the royal family and others, taking them into captivity. And then after 11 years, in 586 BC, the king of Babylon is back for a third time. 
this time burning Jerusalem to the ground, destroying the temple, and effectively taking the entire population of Israel into captivity, enslaving everybody, and leaving only the poorest of the poor left in the land. Jeremiah lived through all of that. He saw it with his own eyes. And what's more, before the events happened, Jeremiah predicted all of this. God, he said, was judging Israel for their sins, and now the day of judgment had come. Indeed, his message is terrifying. I'm reading Jeremiah 15, verses 1 to 2. Then the Lord said to me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my heart would not turn toward this people. Send them out of my sight, let them go. And when they ask you, where shall we go? You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, those who are for pestilence to pestilence, and those who are for the sword to the sword, and those who are for famine to famine, and those who are for captivity to captivity. But lest you get a picture of a hellfire and brimstone preacher who's simply rubbing his hands with glee as he condemns people, I mean, you'd be wrong. See, Jeremiah is often called a weeping prophet. That's because for most of his life, before the disaster that befell Jerusalem, he not only foretold it, describing in detail what was going to happen, but, and this is amazing, he could hardly bear his own words. Listen to Jeremiah 14, verse 17. You shall say to them this word, let my eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people is shattered with a great wound, with a very grievous blow. So if you don't know the book of Jeremiah, let me describe it to you. It is a book in which dark clouds just keep rolling in, all described through the tears of a prophet. So it should not surprise us that in this book, in this horrible and yet passionate book, there is a verse that Matthew quotes on the very day of the mass killing of the children in Bethlehem. And that verse from Jeremiah about Rachel weeping for her murdered children and refusing to be comforted. I mean, where else would you find a verse like that but in the book of Jeremiah? Except, and here's the surprise, the verse that Matthew quotes is found in a section of Jeremiah, that section being Jeremiah chapters 30 to 33, a section so filled with overwhelming hope and inexpressible joy that many Bible teachers have called those chapters the book of comfort. In fact, this section is so gracious and beautiful that it's stunning against the background in which they come. In fact, those chapters contain one of the most famous passages in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31 verse 31 states, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And this new covenant is the basis for the gospel of Jesus, the covenant in the blood of Jesus, where as Jeremiah promises us, God will forgive our iniquity and remember our sins no more. But not only are Jeremiah chapters 30 to 33 so hopeful, so filled with light against the background of such horrible blackness, but these chapters are also messianic. See, they promise Messiah. They promise that the days of war and evil, of mass slayings, and indeed the days of suffering of Israel are coming to an end. See, and that's what makes Jeremiah so fascinating. It's not as if he was not a realist. I mean, he understood evil better than most of us. Indeed, he described it best in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, where he said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? See, I did a little computer work. How many mass shootings have there been in the U.S. alone since the Columbine massacre in 1999 in Littleton, Colorado, in which two teenage boys shot and killed 12 of their classmates from that time up until the present? Well, the answer has been that there have been over 35, on average between two to three every year. And I'm aware that there have been a disproportionate amount of those in the U.S., but let's not forget places like Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal and the massacre of 14 women. Or or how many of us have heard of the 36-year-old villager in Henan province in China who with a knife stabbed 23 children in a primary school? I mean, this on top of the terrorist incidents that we all hear about and fear. See, I tell you this, if Christ delays his coming, There are many slaughters of innocents still yet to come. This will not be the last. But I'll also say that as horrible as these events are, how do they compare with the mass killings of the 20th century? Under Hitler and and Mao and Stalin and Pol Pot, how long of a list do you want? 
Or should I tell you about how often unborn children are killed every day in our country in our abortuaries? I mean, how evil and wicked is the human heart? Jeremiah said it's desperately sick. So it should not surprise us that Jeremiah, who saw more brutal slayings than any human being should have to see, has something to say that Matthew quotes when he tells of Herod's slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. We'll be right back with more from Dr. Neufeld in just a moment. You know, the next generation has serious questions about life and faith. Maybe you've heard a son or a friend or a granddaughter ask a few. That's why we have an entire ministry dedicated to answering questions that demand answers, and that's in doubt. With a weekly podcast that dives into the toughest topics, articles that engage life, and videos that encourage biblical living, In Doubt, a ministry of Back to the Bible Canada, empowers young adults across this nation with God's truth. Coming in the new year, In Doubt is releasing a new five-week film series digging into the book of Jude called Jude for the Faith. For individual and small group use, it encourages young Christians to fight for the one true faith in a dark world. To find out more about In Doubt or to donate or to invest in this important ministry, go to indoubt.ca or call us at 1-800-663-2425. That's 1-800-663-2425. Now let's go back to the Bible with Dr. John Newfeld. Jeremiah was the prophet who understood the human heart to be wicked, and so he weeps. He weeps because Israel, the chosen people, have turned from the living God to idols. And he weeps because of the consequences that their sin will bring upon themselves. And then as we come to the book of Consolation, chapters 30 to 33, Jeremiah says some things that are simply, well, wonderful. I'm reading chapter 30, verses 2 and 3. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. And so Jeremiah begins his book of hope with the words that with all of Israel's sin, God is not finished. He will restore. They may have all been taken into captivity and slavery, but God will bring them back to this place. Now to verses 12 to 14. For thus says the Lord, your hurt is incurable and your wound is grievous. There is not to uphold your cause, no medicine for your wound, no healing for you. All your lovers have forgotten you. They care nothing for you, for I have dealt you the blow of an enemy, the punishment of a merciless foe, because your guilt is great, because your sins are flagrant. Please know that these are the words of condemnation of a God who will not pass over human sin and demands an accountability. I mean, they're not easy words, but all of this is at the center of the Christmas story. So that's the background to both the story of Jeremiah and the story of the birth of Jesus. Look, we don't tell the story of Christmas one time of the year so we can again focus on everything that's good in all of us. No, the Christmas story cannot be told unless the raw, incurable wound of the human heart is exposed, along with the sorrow that we all bear. See, there is incredibly good news from God, but in Jeremiah's case, evil was at the door, and in Matthew's case... Herod was butchering innocent children while Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus became refugees in Egypt. You can't have real hope unless you see the things that are evil for what they truly are. In Jeremiah's day, the people needed more than relief that one day after the Babylonian captivity, the Jews would come back to their own land. You know, they did do that, and they rebuilt the temple, but soon the ugliness came back. The Jews were conquered by the Greeks and then by the Syrians, and under the Syrians came a madman named Antiochus Epiphanes and how he murdered the Jews. See, that's why the Jews celebrate Hanukkah this time of the year. It's a liberation from that demonic man named Antiochus. But after the liberation of those days came the days of the Romans, and finally, of course, came the horrible slaughter of the Jews in AD 70. And today, although Israel has returned to their land, they're still surrounded by people who are determined to destroy them again. I mean, simply going back to your land is not the kind of hope that Jeremiah was talking about. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 10 and 11. Then fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from far away 
and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and none shall make them afraid. For I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. I will make a full end of all the nations among whom I have scattered you. But of you I will not make a full end. And then to verse 17, For I will restore health to you, and your wounds I will heal. But if the time after the Babylonian captivity is not the time of their healing, when is it? See, in Jeremiah 30, verse 21, Jeremiah tells us when that's going to be. He says, Their prince shall be one of themselves. Their ruler shall come out from their midst. That, says Jeremiah, is when the healing will ultimately come. It comes when the Messiah comes. Now, here's what we all know about healing. It's temporary. Not only did Israel return to their land only to be harassed again, this is a metaphor for all of us. See, you can be healed of cancer, but I promise you this, if it's not cancer in your future, something else is going to get you. Whenever we're healed, it's only for a time. See, that's also true of all atrocities. They are brought to an end eventually, only to have more time in the future. But there's a promise in Jeremiah that a king, an anointed one, the Messiah, who will sit on David's ancient throne will come. And in that day, no one will ever make Israel afraid again. It all depends on only one thing. It depends on the Messiah. And so with this theme, we turn to Jeremiah 31 verses 11 to 12. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, the oil, and over the young of the flock and of the herd. Their life shall be like a watered garden, and they shall languish no more. That's not just what Israel wants. It's it's what we all want. And with those words of hope come words that Matthew would quote some 600 years later at the slaughter of the innocents. Verse 15, thus says the Lord, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and great weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Let's understand what Jeremiah is saying in context. Rachel was the wife of Jacob and the mother of some of the tribes of Israel. She gave birth to Joseph, of whom would come the two half-tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. She also gave birth to Benjamin, and then she died in childbirth. She died just outside of Bethlehem, and in context here, she simply stands for the mother of Israel. But her weeping voice is heard in Ramah. See, Ramah is also just outside of Bethlehem, where some scholars think that Rachel was buried. But in the time of Jeremiah, according to Jeremiah 40, verse 1, Ramah had become a transit camp for refugees. The Babylonians would drag their prisoners five miles from Jerusalem to a staging area at Ramah, where they would be chained together for their long and anguished march to Babylon. Bible teacher Philip Ryken put it this way, It must have been a place of utter despair, he says. Fathers chafing against their chains and mothers lifting their voices in lamentation. Their children, their babies were gone. Some had starved during the siege, and others had been put to the sword during the invasion. In the confusion of battle, still others had been ripped from their mother's breasts, never to be seen again. And as Mother Israel watches, her children are being butchered and dragged into slavery, and she weeps. There are no words of comfort that can be given to her, and if you tried to comfort her, she would refuse you. And that's what Matthew did when he showed us the picture of the birth of Christ. Yes, it's true that the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, telling him to rise and take the mother and the child and flee to Egypt. No doubt Joseph had little time to grab whatever belongings they had and go south in the desert and hurry and run, for the cruel and savage Herod had murder in his eyes. And flee they did, in the middle of the night. Matthew, in telling the story, is aware that God is protecting his Messiah. God will not allow all the villains of history from bringing his hope into the world, but in telling the story, Matthew remembers the hope of Jeremiah, and yet that hope is set against the blackness of human misery. Christ escapes, and yet the doomed children of Bethlehem die, and Rachel, well, she weeps. But, and this is so vital, when Matthew quotes from Jeremiah, he's doing it for a purpose. Yeah, it's true that Christmas never hides its face from the sin and the ugliness that make up human existence, but Christmas never gives in to despair either. 
Christmas is the celebration of hope. In the very place where despair is the deepest, the greatest light is shining. And so after telling the despair of Rachel weeping, Jeremiah adds these words. He says, Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. So what does that mean? How can Rachel, who is inconsolable, now be consoled? How can enormous sin and enormous loss and enormous evil be redeemed? For Jeremiah, that happens when a new covenant is made through the Messiah. At that time, Rachel will stop her weeping. And that's the hope of Christmas. The coming of Christ marks a time to come when Rachel will weep no more, when all human tears will be dried up, when despair comes to an end, and when war and terrorism and evil gives way to the Prince of Peace. That's why we sing this this marvelous Christmas carol at this time of year. It goes like this. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. And that's our hope as well. We hope that this coming of the Christ into the world will yet spark the day in his return when all human tears will be dried up, when all who have put their hope in the one to come will see in his glorious coming the end of all human misery, when sin will be no more, and when God's kingdom will reign forevermore. Have a merry, merry Christmas. John, I think I have an important question for you today, because a lot of us question about the second coming of Jesus. How does the second coming of Jesus resolve some of those deep-seated disappointments and pains that we experience in life? Some of our greatest disappointments are with things in this world not working out as we think they should or as we plan that they should, and it's gotten a great amount of pain in our lives. Um, I think the idea of Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted as an apt description of so many of us. But if I can gently say this, one of the reasons why God allows sorrow into our lives is to remind us that our hope was never in this world. Indeed, there are no eternal joys that this world has for us. There are either heavenly joys or there are no eternal joys at all. So the, the, the second coming of Jesus should remind us uh, that we are yet hopeful for an event that will happen in the future and that everything that we long for is in that and not in the fading pleasures and the comforts of this world. Back to the Bible, leading you forward in your walk with Jesus every day. Two thousand seventeen has been a year of great blessing. God has allowed us to teach His Word across our nation, ever expanding our opportunity. Daily, the Bible is being taught on air, online, via podcast, audio mail, MP3, in print, and of course now in partnership with Back to the Bible India. And two thousand seventeen offers even more. In the months to come, Dr. John Newfeld will air a new weekly podcast called Truth and Life, answering your burning Bible questions. We're working to launch a new kids' Bible engagement app, a new in-doubt Bible study series for millennials, and conduct two pastors' training seminars in India. This is just the tip of the iceberg. But these ministries and much more are dependent upon your continued support. So join with us to reach our overall year-end ministry goal of $500,000 by December 31st. Give us a call at 1-800-663-2425. That's 1-800-663-2425. Or donate online at backtothebible.ca.